Good morning, everyone. So I'm here today with Professor Stuart Biddle. Hello, Stuart. Yeah, hi, Rachel. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you, Stuart. Thank you so much for chatting with us today. Um, we are going to talk to you about physical activity. So um, it's it's your specific topic of interest um, and you do a lot of work in that area. So before we delve into physical activity, I was wondering if you might be able to just um, introduce yourselves to everyone looking at this and tell us a little bit about yourself and and the work that you do. Yes, well, currently I'm a Professor of Active Living and Public Health in Australia. It's at Victoria University, which is in Melbourne. Uh, but I've only been here two years and uh, I left the UK in 2014, where I was Professor of Physical Activity and Health at Loughborough, Loughborough University. And uh, my work has really evolved from taking a more focused approach on psychology of sport, exercise and physical activity, and then morphed into a wider public health or health researcher over the last uh, decade. And I have obviously interest in physical activity, sedentary behavior, and particularly around behavior change. So that probably best sums up where I'm at at the moment, having moved from just psychology into wider issues of behavior change. Interesting. So are you psychology background? Is that your background? Well, I started out in physical education, which was pretty much all you could do in those days. Uh, sport and exercise science, as it's now called, uh, only came in just after I graduated. So I trained as a physical education teacher, went to the United States and studied sport and exercise psychology, and then did a psychology PhD in psychology. Yeah, I gradually drifted to general psychology from uh, from that physical education background. And then how did you get into the public health sphere with physical activity? How does that work? Yeah, over time in my career, when I was studying psychology of sport, psychology of exercise, uh, and what have you, um, I was getting uh, access to a few papers around public health, around people's adherence to health, behaviors or non adherent health behaviors. That really fascinated me. I got more and more into the psychology of motivation, health, adherence, health. And I, I went into that. I, I was doing what you might call individual psychology, people's motivation, people's attitude, and so on. And that's fine. But subsequently, I thought, well, that's only part of the, of the bigger picture. You also have to understand how we can change populations or how we can change large groups of people, not just individuals. And so, although I still do individual psychology, I'm also very keen on uh, population approaches to health and, and see the two going hand in hand. Okay. Um, so I'm really interested to talk to you about uh, the psychology of behavioural change in physical activity and things. But before we go on to that, mate, could we just... Um, so, f as a clinician, if I as a clinician, what are the main things that we need to know as clinicians about physical activity? You know, if we're thinking of um, integrating more physical activity into sort of every contact that we have with a, with our clients or our patients, um, obviously we're we're seeing them for a specific condition that we're seeing them for or a, a situation. Um, but if we're thinking about put, integrating physical activity into that interaction, what sort of things do we need to know and should we be thinking about? Yeah, it's a good good point. Now, first of all, I think we need to understand the behaviour itself. So what is physical activity? And, you know, a few years ago, if we were asked that question, it would have been, well, it's exercise or it's moderate to vigorous physical activity. What else is there? And I think now we're much more aware that there's a continuum of movement actually from no movement at all, which is too much sitting time, right through to very vigorous forms of physical activity. So we could talk about too much sitting. We could talk about doing light physical activity, which is being on your feet and just moving a bit more. Then on to more traditional, moderate to vigorous physical activity, might include exercise, might include sport. And then even more, you know, even higher forms of uh, higher levels of vigorous physical activity. So 
we've got this spectrum that I think is really important and we need to understand people's preferences for that, uh, what they believe about for those different forms of movement, what would be acceptable to them, we're trying to change their behavior, what their goals are to do it. And actually, goals around health are only sometimes a small part of it. It might, it might get them started, but it, it won't keep them motivated. So we need to think about a wide range of factors to do with individual preferences and motivation and, and, uh, and, and start from there, really, in, in, in individual consultation. And also selling messages to the public that it's not just about one of those so um so when we're working with the individual so it's useful for us to have an understanding of what motivates people and what sort of goals we're aiming for isn't it um and and you know there are many guidelines and things about levels of physical activity but in clinical populations how do we sort of what should we be thinking about when we're trying to tailor it to individual people that we have and i know that's a difficult question because every Every individual's different and comes with a different condition, but is there anything that we should be thinking about then? Well, I think if, it, if it's a more clinical setting where somebody ha presents with a, you know, a condition, whether it's for physios or not, um, then they might have a more defined goal in their mind, which is to alleviate the problem or to deal with the problem. So if they've got diabetes or they, they've got heart, a heart condition, then clearly some form of physical activity uh, they want that form of physical activity to be beneficial for that condition. Um, but if we step back and say, well, what about, you know, so-called general population who don't do enough physical activity? And whilst they may not have an obvious chronic uh, condition, we know that they are. So the point was that uh, for the general population, although they may not be presenting to a specialist with a with a condition, we know that they are probably less likely to be, that they haven't got very high levels of physical activity. Uh, they may have an underlying condition that they may not be aware of. And, and so it won't be so obvious as to what might motivate them in the, in the first stage. Um, so I think, you know, we have to tap into what the individuals value. And, and most, most individuals actually value some kind of psychological well-being, quality of life message you know more, more than a, more than a physical message yeah so just to repeat that just because we lost you slightly so that was they, so most of individuals value some kind of psychological well-being and quality of life um and i and i guess it, when we yeah. when we sit down and talk to them we that's the sort of thing we should try and explore with them so that we can set um joint goals with them yeah, I, I think sometimes we've, um, yeah, absolutely right about joint goals. I, I think sometimes we've gone straight in at the, at the physical level and assume that everybody wants to do physical activity to solve some physical problem. Now, of course, that could be highly important, but actually it may not be at the, the higher up their list of priorities. Uh, it, I think you'll find a lot of people are motivated by wanting a better quality of life, and, and feeling better mentally, if not physically. Hopefully we can get the two together. But I think just to go in and assume everybody's interested in obesity, everybody's interested in um, diabetes or whatever, may not necessarily be true. Um, and, but quality of life is probably quite high up most people's list of, uh, of interests and, and uh, goals. Yeah. So I guess the thing that we need to be doing is exploring with them that or trying to encourage them that physical activity is something that can change their quality of life. Yes. And, and we tend to see physical activity or the, the, the public message of physical activity is that it's something that will, will affect you physically, which, of course, it will. Um, but we need to emphasize, I think, mental, psychological well-being outcome because they're quite tangible and they're usually fairly immediate unlike unlike some physical outcomes um, so important as it is for example to keep the weight down um, weight weight management through physical activity is extremely laborious and slow process and a lot of people give up well before they make progress so 
whereas quality of life, at least immediate feelings of well-being and vigor and, and energy. Yeah, yeah, quality of life and well-being. It's interesting, I think, because as physiotherapists, we we think more about function. We do think more about function, and we do think a lot about movement and moving well and all that sort of thing. And perhaps we do need to think more about quality of life and psychological benefits, in particularly in. I mean, and what we're talking about is in relation to um, finding things that will encourage the behaviour change, isn't it? So, exactly. yeah, so. Exactly. so- so you can see the well-being as an outcome in itself, but that doesn't necessarily make them better physically. So if they've got a physiotherapy issue and they feel better as a result of treatment, but the treatment still hasn't quite got to the stage you want to get at, okay, it's a start, but ultimately you want them to adhere to the process of rehabilitation. That will come about by feelings of well-being, feelings of um, positive emotions and attachment to the to the um, to the exercises that they're doing. Uh, so it, it has it has a dual function. It has an outcome in itself, but it helps adherents yeah. to come back and keep doing that behaviour. And to be honest, that's where we fail with a lot of physical activity programs. People drop out because they don't get that kind of they're not doing the right thing that makes them come back in, in the future. Okay, so. So, uh, s- with behavioural change, um, we're talking about finding something that motivates them, finding that something that they can relate to, and setting joint goals with them. Is there anything else in the whole behavioural change um, knowledge that we should know about, or that you explore, or that um, any you know any key messages on behavioural change that we need? Yeah, definitely. So first of all, I think in addition to those factors, we must try to make the behavior that we're after, physical activity or even rehabilitation, whatever it is, as easy to do as possible. Now, it's never going to be perfect. It's never going to just be so easy that we don't even think about it. But that's the ultimate goal, that we do it because it's so easy and convenient and enjoyable. And we keep that in mind. There's a model called the behavior change wheel. Okay. And it's quite a nice model developed by Susan Mickey and colleagues at UCL. And what they say in this is that your behavior, whether that's diet behavior, uh, you know, other other health behaviors, physical activity, smoking behavior, there are several factors that might predict behavior, what is the opportunity to do that? Do you have the physical and the psychological, sorry, the, the, the physical and the sort of environmental opportunity to be physically active? Or have we created a society that makes it difficult to be physically active? Well, yes, to a certain extent we have, but equally there are opportunities to be physically active if we want to take like climb stairs, for example. So, you know, we need to have opportunity. Um, we need to have some motivation, of course. Um, and these kind of things really, you know, drive your 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 behaviour. I'm trying to think what the third factor is now. And I've completely <laughs> forgotten. That's all right. Go. That's totally fine. Um, spontaneous interviewing. No, that's and, fine. So uh, we, we've talked about <laughs> we've talked about um, motivation and opportunity. Um, so far yeah yeah and actually i'm just going to draw something up on my screen here while we're talking that's fine uh, i'll tell you i'll tell you an interesting story while you're doing that Uh, talking about opportunity i was in a hotel the other day at a conference and i was on the fourth floor and i could not take the stairs to get to reception there was no way to do it so this is this is a classic example of how we're building environments that don't encourage physical activity and the other funny thing i saw at the same conference was a man coming down the escalator, sitting down on it. <laughs> now, that's a first. I've not seen that before. He was sitting. Uh, of course, most people, even at physical activity conferences, stand still on the escalator. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, now, maybe that tells us that these things are very habitually driven, actually. Um, you know, um, now, to, much to my embarrassment, I've now remembered what the third uh, factor was. So I said there was um, sort of, 
social or environmental opportunities, physical opportunities. There's motivation. And I want to come back actually to the motivation in a minute. The, the third factor, which to my eternal embarrassment I forgot, is capability. Right? So have you got the psychological? Yeah, so it's capability, physical and psychological capability. So in a perfect world, we've got good motivation, opportunity, and capability. So if those three are in kind of harmony, then you've got a pretty good chance you'll do this behavior. But if one of those is really negative, you're going to, going to struggle a bit. So we need to tackle try, try to provide people the opportunity. Try to give people the capability. It's partly psychological and content. And obviously, obviously drive some motivation. Yeah. So we're looking at opportunity. Will be uh, opportunity. We're thinking about um, probably giving them ideas, setting goals, capability. Yeah. We need to be assessing what will suit them and what's not too difficult for them, and and just giving them easy opportunities, I guess, to start with, or making, yeah. or or just assessing their specific condition and situation. And giving them something that they are capable of. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so it's these small steps idea, you know, that just build up, build up, build up, and it, and and you you won't notice that it's getting a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Because you're getting, but you're getting, you're getting better at it. Yeah. And they get they gain the confidence to do it. Then. And then with motivation, what sort of things are we thinking about when we try and motivate our patients or or the individuals, anyone that we're working with? Yeah, there are two factors here. One is what you might typically think of as motivation, which is quite sort of consciously driven thinking and, and, and planning and so on. So, you know, you might say, right, later in the day, I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to go at four o'clock. I'm going to do this route. I'm going to go with my friend. Shoes red. Very conscious plan. That's fine need to do that. In addition, some forms of motivation are much less conscious. And I put it another way, our behavior is driven by less conscious drives and motivation. This is where habit comes in. This is where people standing in the nest, they've probably not even made that conscious decision. They've just got on the escalator. The brain is now telling them the subconscious it's an escalator, you stand, you don't walk. Yeah. They've not really thought about it. A better example, actually, is when I teach students. So I say to the students, when they walk in the room, I said, how many of you consciously thought about sitting down or not sitting down? They look at me as if I'm nuts. Yeah. They say, oh, I didn't think about it. I said, no, exactly. You come in and you sit down. So you have to, because you're conscious sorry, you're subconsciously driven to this habitual behavior. It's a lecture, it's got loads of seeds, and this is what you're supposed to do in lecture. You're supposed to sit down. So you want to break up these behaviors. You need to, you need to change the environment a bit. So you, you're well aware of standing desks, for example, which I'm working on right now. Well, without, without this, it would make it very much more difficult for to conduct this uh, discussion standing up which happens to be my preference so you've changed the environment made it very easy in fact, i don't really have to think just i'm just doing it. now i have to think about it to buy the debt in the first place. but after that it becomes a bitch that's the kind of thing okay so let's just go back to um <clears throat> When we, um, so part of behavior change is that we're trying to change habits. Um, and mm. one of the ways to do that is to is changing the environment that we're, that we're in. And so you were talking about your example to your students, how um, you when they come into a room and they all go to sit down, how you ask them, how many of them thought about sitting down and they all sit, or standing up alternatively. And they all, and it's like a um, subconscious thing that we all just sit down when there's a chair available or something. So, um, and, and you're just talking about, and, and another example, that you're talking about is your standing desk and we can see that you're standing up there so tell us a bit more about this sort of changing the environment yeah yeah so i think it's something we've we've missed in the last few years or w w let's put it another way we've only become more aware of it in the last few years 
if you change the environment, you've got a much better chance of enabling uh, physical activity to to occur. It's not going to be the magic pill, but it's it's one of those facilitators. It's providing opportunity. Um, you know, you still might require a little bit of motivation at times, but you know, it provides a big opportunity yeah. to to be physically active or or not to sit, to stand, or whatever it is you're trying to change. Um, so we just need to try to break into these habitual cycles that we, we get a, get ourselves into. So are there changing any, the environment is one help for that. Right. Are, are there any others that we can break into for changing habits? Uh, what in what way? What what? Uh, so what so we've talked about changing the environment that will help us break some of our habits um, in relation to being physically inactive or sedentary. Is there are there any other particular things that we can think about that help to change habits in those um, inactivity habits in people? Well, of course, habits by by definition are are kind of repeated, less conscious ways of operating. So. It may sound obvious, but the more you do the behavior, the more it becomes a bitch. And um, you know, that, that might come about through lots of different prompts, which would be like social support and social encouragement and social norms. So at work, I see a lot of people standing and eating now, whereas before that wasn't the social norm, now it is. And this is with people who are not necessarily committed interested in this area as, as I am but they just get the idea that it's okay to stand and oh, maybe that feels okay and it becomes more habitual because it becomes more frequent yeah well, there's a social norm element to that so I guess break up yeah. social norm. so I guess one of the things to say to individuals that we're working with is that, that it's like it's okay to be a bit different you know if you're trying to be more physically active if no one else is being active around you in whatever circumstance you're in it's okay to be different to be more physically active just to to reinforce the positive message with them I suppose yeah I, I, I agree with that and also to um, try to encourage others to think in, in the same way so one good example is about car travel you know car travel is door to door yeah. Motorized transport, which cuts out a lot of physical activity. Now, I'm, I'm not saying we get rid of cars, but if you can switch some of that mode of transport to, say, public transport, you're going to include a lot more walking. And therefore, when people say, would you like a ride? Would you like a lift in the car? Actually, the, the positive response would be, no, thank you. I'm really going to enjoy taking public transport. Yeah. I know that might seem a bit weird to some people, but, um, you know, I generally don't like to be off the lift because I actually want to walk. take a tram, take a bus, but, but I want to walk, essentially. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't find it very helpful when people ask if I want to ride a car. We've got to try and change those social norms. Yeah, exactly. So, so... And, and so what we're talking about is behavior change. So we've talked about, you know, to encourage this behavior change and we're interested in the change, the behavior of, of helping people to be more physically active. So we've talked about <clears throat> the environment, uh, opportunities and kind of changing the environment so that we can be more physically active. We've talked a little bit about capabilities, how we encourage people to you know, look at what they're capable of, don't give them too much to do, no overfacing them, a little bit at a time. And also about um, motivation and and changing people's habits um, um, and some of the things that can help people to change their habits. So is there anything else that's key in behaviour change that we should be thinking about when we're working with, let's just talk talking about individuals at the moment. Well, I mean, we could uh, just say a little bit more about the motivation side and, you know, setting goals and everything is fine. Uh, you could also self-monitor your behaviours. You know, we have all these wearable technology gadgets now, but you could also do something very simple, like keep a diary, how much walking you're doing, how often you're going to do some exercise session, 
or swimming or walk the dog or whatever it is. And self-monitoring is very important. It gives you feedback. It gives you problems. So that's quite a nice way of helping. And then one of the most critical forms of motivation or behavior change is self-confidence. Uh, we can help people feel more and more confident doing something, just doing the behavior. You don't have to be good at it. Just do the behavior. And that's also sometimes referred to as self-efficacy. And uh, this is crucial in all health behavior. So we need to help people feel more confident by having a little bit of success, seeing a bit of progress, seeing other people do that behavior success. I can't. Um, so, that, so, the, so, so giving them more confidence, just to repeat that, because you were slightly broken up, just, just on the motivation side, more confidence um, and goal setting, giving them goals to do. Um, yep. Yep. Anything else that we need to be thinking about uh, as well? So, so motivation wise, it's just about confidence and goals mainly. Is that correct? Well, it's quite a complex area and I guess we could always ha add to that. But I, one other simple thing to look at is so if people are trying to make a change to their behavior, they will want to weigh up the pros and cons of and quite often people will come out and think that it's too much like hard work, I haven't got the energy, I haven't got the time. So it would be quite useful to to look at a pros versus cons list. It's called a decision balance exercise. So, okay, let me have a look at the pluses, let me have a look at the minuses, let's weigh them up and, and let's hopefully, you know, see the positives and deal with the negatives, shift ourselves continue and that's the that's the ideal yeah that's really useful that's something that we could definitely use as a sort of small conversation point in our contact with with people that we're working with so we've talked quite a lot about <clears throat> um working or introduce introducing more physical activity into our interactions with individuals um and and we've talked a lot about the behavior change how do we extrapolate that in what can we do as individual clinicians at a population level what should we be thinking about at population level how can we help to make a difference so if you think of all of these different influences like um layers of an onion so the the inside is is the is the individual then the next layer out is is more social um you know, your immediate social groups, your friends, your, your, your influences. And all. Then you've got more environmental influences outside that. And you've even got more sort of governmental policy influences outside that. Okay. So if you go back to the individual in the middle, the next stage that a therapist or a health professional could do is to try to tap into the wider social context. Your local community, your professional network um, and all of this and it's also how you behave as a professional having that social influence of people around, on people around you and uh, so other people see that oh yeah that person's really active and even though they got busy by and and that has a wider social influence now of course you can only have so much of an influence doing that it won't affect the whole society that stuff that's the next level up. Then if we get these environmental changes where we make a little bit of a, uh, a request to organizations to provide standing desks, to put signs up at the escalator, to encourage people walking, um, and so on, and then even contribute to policy changes, which of course is the most abstract, right? we're starting to make a difference at, at a societal level. At an individual and I guess some of it as well isn't it is is a making a behavioral change in us as health health professionals to to um, become habituated to thinking more about this every day isn't it um, yeah it's 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 tough sometimes because you know we, we we sometimes feel we have to be perfect ourselves and of course we, we never will be but I think to roll more uh, some of these key behaviors is pretty important 
you know, if I'm a professor of physical activity and or professor of active living, uh, as the, my title is here in Australia, it'd be a bit ironic if every day I, I, I drove to work and never went to the gym, never did any physical activity. That, that would be almost hypocritical. Yeah. So you, you have to model these behaviours. And, and whilst, you know, as I say, we're never going to be perfect, uh, I, I try to, to 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 live what I I'm encouraging. Yeah, and I guess and if and uh, that's the best way to start, isn't it? To live live uh, practice what we preach, and then if we're doing that regularly, that will come into our thinking as we work through the working day with people, um, and with the local communities that we work with as well. Yeah, yeah I th- I th- I, and I think we understand then that, it, that yes, how to do these but also what some of the barriers I, I, I fully understand when people say I've got a busy life I can't fit this in yeah, I think if you're active yourself then you also understand that there are some barriers as well so maybe you can help people overcome just got a better empathy yeah absolutely um, we all understand those barriers you know everyone's busy we're all too busy all the time aren't we these days and, and, and we just have to come back to the thinking of the, or the realization of how important it is and how inactive that we've become as a as a global population, really. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. And I think it has become more recognized in society that physical inactivity is a problem. Of course, the next step is what, what do we do about it, hence all the discussions we've had so far. But I think if we're active as health professionals, it gives the right message and it helps us understand the behavior a little better. Yeah, definitely. Well, good. So, Stuart, we've talked all about, we've talked a lot about behavioural change, which has been really, really useful, and how we can encourage individuals to change their behaviour to be more physically active. Um, and also just discuss briefly what we can do as health professionals ourselves and also at a sort of in, at a community and wider um, level, population kind of level. Are there any... Um, are there any other things that you would like to talk about that we haven't covered um, while while we have this opportunity to um, talk to you about physical activity to to the healthcare professionals and any other participants that might be watching this? Have you any other messages? Well, I've, you know, we, we've covered quite a lot of ground, but one of the one of the environments in which a lot of these things might either take place or be influenced by is the family environment. You know, a lot of people live in families or, or, or at least partnerships and so on. And as a result, the influence of one person on the other is pretty important. I guess it's reinforcing this idea of social influence, social norms. And, and, and if we can encourage our immediate social group to get involved, so parents with children, children with parents, partner with partner, then, you know, that that's going to help. Because if, if you've got one person resistant, yeah, it's going to make things a little tough. Yeah, that's a good point. It's good. And, and I guess we should be trying to talk to the whole family as well if we get that opportunity with the, with the contacts that we have with individuals. Um, yeah, good. Um, and I guess we get that opportunity, don't we? Especially in the, if we're working in a hospital environment and we're seeing the family quite a lot. So that's that's a good message. That's a good thing to think about. Um, yeah. The, the only other thing I would say is, is, again, we have rather sort of social stereotypes about who should be active and so on. And that, phys- that physical activity is really for the young and active. Well, no, it's for everybody. And from birth to death, and we've just finished uh, hosting the World Congress on Active Aging here in Melbourne. Yes. And the message was loud and clear that it's never too late and that physical activity is massively important for older adults, particularly in the current climate where we're going to live much longer and, you know, potentially with quite serious chronic disease. And we must have physical activity to try to reduce the effect of that and, and so on. So, it's never too late might be a great message. Never too late and probably and never too early either. Or never too early. Never Absolutely. too early. Never too early to stop those in those young children becoming sedentary, yeah. um, which is more common these days as well. So, um, oh, so yeah, go on. No, 
you go. <laughs> so I was just going to round up, actually. Um, you know, it's been great to hear all of all of your um, thoughts on behaviour change and how we can help people to become more active. Um, any last messages? You're about to say something. Is there anything last messages? Uh Okay, two, two, two comments. So okay. when I was in the UK up to 2014, I was involved with the 2011 UK guidelines for physical activity. And it's interesting that they went from the old guidelines, which was for young people, that's under age, but above five children and, and adults. Those are the only two sets of guidelines. Then we went to early years, so three school children. Yeah. Children and adolescents, adults, older adults. Yeah. So that's the birth to death continuum that, that we say is important. Um, yeah, the, the second message I'll leave you with is, is a message. That is, we should sit less, move more. In fact, you could say, do more. I mean, do, do even more. That's good. So sit less, move more, do more. Do more. So, uh, what you could actually say is you could rephrase that and say, um, sit, sitting less is good, moving more is better, um, then being much more active is even better, something like that. So, it's a continuum. It's a continuum. If you, do, if you just sit less, that's a good thing. But you should try and move more and you should try to move, you know, more and more as time goes. Do a bit more. That, that's I think that's a great message. Sit less, do more, and then do a bit more. Um, really useful. So Stuart, it's been absolutely fabulous to talk to you today. I'm sorry that your internet's been a little, that our internet's been a little bit disrupted, but I think we've got a lot of messages from you today, which has been great. Um, is there anywhere that people can find out more about you and your work um, online? Well, I work at Victoria University in Melbourne, so any search of me under that heading would, would find my web page. Uh, I've also written a book on psychology of physical activity, oh, I did which is now in, its, yeah, now in its third edition, uh, published by Taylor and Francis or Routledge. They're the same publisher, Routledge. What's that book yeah. called? Is it? Psycholo psychology of Physical Activity. Perfect. Uh, and it's in conjunction with two other colleagues. And uh, we're, we've been writing that for the last 20 years in different updates. So uh, maybe, maybe that might be a nice uh, place to get, a, get some summary. Uh, definitely. So we'll put a link, definitely put a link to your profile page at the University at Work. And, and I'm sure we can find all your research there. And, a book, and we'll look up your book and put a link to that as well. That'll be really, really useful. So, That's Stuart, great. it's been. Are you on Twitter at all? I am. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, Stuart underscore Biddle. I think is the uh, very original handle. That's a good handle. You got your name in there, so that's good. So we yeah. can we can at the risk of you being inundated for, by people on Twitter, we can find Stuart at Stuart underscore Biddle on Twitter as well. So we'll put a link to that. Stuart, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been really helpful. Thank you, Rachel, for the invitation. I've enjoyed it.